Hello, and today I want to talk about the Lewis II sector model. Now, this is a um, quite an in depth model for development, and there's quite a lot to go through, so I'm warning you now this will be quite a long video. Um, but I'll try to keep it as concise as possible because it's a summary video. So let's start with how do we arrive at looking at the Lewis model? Well, we're looking at the question how, how do we develop economies? And we've been looking at the classical theories, which suggest that you have something which is called a surplus, basically, you know, um, profits, investments, that kind of thing, which if you increase that, then you increase development and economic growth. And so Lewis agrees that, you know, this surplus needs to be increased and that's how we're going to lead to development. But the difference with Lewis is, what he say, what he does is he doesn't provide a theory on how to reform the capital market, thus increase the surplus and thus increase um, economic development. He brings a theory of labor and how to avoid labor market failure and how to essentially use the labor market um, uh, to increase the surplus and thus create growth. Now, I, d I do want you to note that a lot of evidence is there saying that when you look at Africa, when you look at Latin America, which we'll also look at in the, uh, in, in the criticisms part of this video, that, um, you know, his model does not essentially work. But I just want to note already from the very start that when he writes this paper, and I've read it, and he basically says that um, it, this, this model is not suitable for Western economies that are already developed. They're not suitable for all economies. And he was basically doing it with Asia in mind. So his is a classical model, and I've already said this because I've said the reason why it's a classical model is it focuses on, you know, a surplus a growth via the capitalist sector and capitalists. But another reason um, why this is essentially um, a classical model is that he says that basically labor market is uh, has unlimited supply, which is different to the, key, uh, the Keynesian uh, perspective. And he gives... Um, five examples of why labor is so-called unlimited in these developing economies and the reason is that labor can be removed from petty trade subsistence casual labor domestic labor and and women they they, they are doing basically jobs and work which has a uh, marginal productivity which is negligible or even um negative so he's saying the reason why the labor market is um has unlimited supplies because there are so many labor uh, so many labor workers in the subsistence sector and also there's so many doing things like you know petty trade and things like that we can move women there's a lot of potential whereas when you go to develop economies there seems to be a limited supply because all of these people have already been um used up so when we're talking about increasing the surplus uh, we're going to do this by transferring labor from essentially something called the subsistence sector to the capitalist sector and how is this possible because the labor supply is unlimited because of i've already told you the examples he's given now what is the difference between the so-called subsistence sector and the capitalist sector because this is his two sector um, economy uh, model what is the difference well it's this that in the capital sec uh, capitalist sector, uh, workers are productive because they're using reproducible capital. Whereas subsistence sector, they're not. And also because there's so many people doing a limited amount of work, marginal productivity is basically uh, negligible or negative. So now we need to talk about wages. Now, wages are high in the industrial sector and low in the subsistence sector. And one of the crucial points why this is so important is this is what attracts labor workers to migrate from subsistence into the industrial sector, allowing capitalists to create profit and reinvest this profit, thus recruit more labor workers, and you're increasing growth all the time. And actually, the productivity in the agricultural sector, it hasn't changed. And the reason why um, it hasn't changed is because it just there was an unlimited supply of labor so now we have to talk about the wages the wage differential now what he says is that the wage in the industrial sector what the capitalists pay um, is basically uh, is determined by the non-industrial sector i.e the subsistence sector so if we look at the subsistence sector we said that the marginal productivity was so low 
So that indicates that the wage is also subsistence, it's very low. So capitalists don't actually have to pay labourers that much to attract them into the industrial sector. So the agricultural sector basically what you can say is it sets a floor a minimum amount the capitalists will pay because if it's less than that then nobody's going to be migrating so that's a minimum but on top of that you have to add the high living costs uh, for coming to live in the city and also there's um, compensation for the poor uh, conditions of cities like people are uh, more likely to die and there's a less um, life expectancy in the city and this these things are actually talked about in the Williamson model and this is why the capitalists have to charge that extra amount. Now I have a diagram here which is from taken from the Lewis article which shows that. So what um, it's showing is that this is the quantity of labour and this is the marginal productivity. So what are he saying at this point is um, the subsistence wage, which is constant, and this point is the uh, industrial sector wage. Now what he's saying is that as we recruit more people, of course marginal productivity goes down because there's only a limited um, amount of work to be done, and but the capitalists only need, they don't need to charge at equal to marginal productivity. They only need to charge at this because it's still higher than subsistence, and workers will still be attracted. So, what's the next point we need to talk about in the Lewis model? Okay, so as labor transfers, the surplus increases. So, how is this happening? Well, I've already mentioned the process, but I'm now going to explain it through the diagram. So again, what we have here is a quantity of labor, the marginal productivity of labor. You have the subsistence wage, and then you have the wage of the um, industrial sector. Now, if we ignore all of those and just focus on the first um, uh, curve, as we saw here, we saw that there's a limited amount of work, and that's why marginal productivity decreases, and wage is always below and it gets to a point where wage is equal to the lowest marginal productivity because that's the sort of the difference from the subsistence sector but what he's saying is over here the workers come they work capitalists make profit they save the profit then they invest all of that profit and they produce more capital so you can recruit more people because your quantity of labor goes up and thus this area the surplus the profits, the investment, um, the development that's going on increases. And so this diagram, Lewis says, can be shown, uh, can be used to show how Lewis's two-sector model can be used for um, development. I've also written here that, do note that Lewis did mention on the side that there is another way to create credit. It's not just by reinvest, uh, create credit, by create capital, sorry, by reinvesting um, the profits made uh, in the capitalist sector, you can also do it through credit creation. So that means using financial intermediaries and these kinds of things. Now, I think this is an important point because Douglas North, another economist, seems to talk a lot about having the right institution. And even in this book I'm reading at the moment, Poor Economics by Banerjee and Dufflow, basically they talk about institutions playing, playing a key role in the development of these countries. So maybe Lewis is also acknowledging the fact that alongside this, maybe he's assuming that there are good um, uh, institutions already there allowing this to happen. Thus, an example of it would be a financial institution. So what's the next point we have to talk about? We have to talk about something called the Lewis turning point. I actually should have drawn a graph, but um, it doesn't matter. I haven't got it. What is the Lewis turning point? So what Lewis says is that at the beginning, you have rapid growth as the labor moves, wages are low, profits are high, keeps getting reinvested, capital is a cycle which goes on. And, and it's, you know, really, it, it just makes sense. But eventually what happens is this unlimited supply does run out. So then what happens? Well, wages have to go up. And when wages go up, then profits go down, capital investment goes down. But eventually wages do rise. They're not going to be constantly low and you're not going to constantly have this unlimited supply because that's what happens. We've seen it with developed economies. And there are three reasons which can be given for why to explain this wage rise in the industrial sector. 
Well, the first thing is in the subsistence sector, we said that the wages from the subsistence sector basically determine they provide a floor for the wages in the industrial sector. Now, what happens is when there's fewer workers left in the subsistence sector, their marginal productivity is high because they're doing, um, you know, three people are doing the work what originally 300 people were doing. So, of course, their productivity is higher than what it was before. And if marginal productivity rises, wages rise. And the second point is also connected that also to try and move those last few workers which have already not been persuaded by the increase in wages to move you need to charge that extra amount to really pull through the last bit of labor left or we could bring in Kalichi's uh, uh, point. I'm not sure how to pronounce him. I think it's Kalichi because he's Polish but what he's basically saying is that um, if economic growth created by the Lewis model, uh, he wasn't talking about the Lewis model, but basically what I'm trying to say is if the economic growth generated by this Lewis um, model and the transfer of labor outstrips the growth of necessity, i.e. the agriculture produced, you have inflation as the price of um, uh, price of the necessities goes up because the productivity is no longer enough. And when you have inflation, then you have inflationary pressures on wage and that also uh, pushes up um, the price. There are also several other things going on. For example, Lewis um, acknowledges that, you know, when you have richer, more developed societies through this transfer of labor, people are more educated. Then what you have is people demanding higher wages. This acknowledging that they work a lot harder. So, so now what? What happens then when you're fully developed after the Lewis turning point? Now wages are rising, development is still going on, economic growth is still there, but it wasn't as fast as uh, before. What do we do now? Well, Lewis says there's two things we can do. The first is mass immigration. You let in, uh, you let you open your borders and you let in people to come into your country. Then what happens, which we can see that UK itself has benefited so much. You let in all these uh, more workers and people come into the country and then you allow them to shift and therefore allow the cycle of surplus creation via a labor in the tra industrial sector um, go on. Or he said you can invest the capital created so, uh, from the surplus in your country into other countries which may require it. Now I want to talk about China at this point because China has this Hakus um, system which is a household registration system which basically provides internal citizenship for rural labor workers and for urban uh, workers. Now why this is important is because China has restricted the door of the rural workers moving in into the urban sector and by having this barrier to migration he, he China has basically slowed the process by which the Lewis model happens and therefore been able to sustain the rapid um, economic growth for longer period of time than the Lewis model would have been had um, there been no barriers. Another reason to talk about China is because China has been putting a lot of investment into Africa. Could this be, because already we have seen the China price and the workers in China, their wages increase. Could this be because their development has already started to slow down? They consider themselves quite developed. And now it's their time to export that capital into other countries and to, you know, change, increase their surplus and help them to grow. It could be that. So, um... Overall, I think his theory does make sense because what we see is in the more developed economies such as America, Britain, uh, Sp um, Spain, but Europe in general and uh, places like that, the share of labor in the agricultural sector as opposed to the industrial sector uh, is very, very low. So it could be an indication that what Lewis was saying is right. But I want to talk to you about four problems. Well, there are four issues, criticisms of his theory, but I don't really deem the fourth one to be a credible one, which I already um, basically hinted at at the beginning of this video. So the first one is a welfare concern. Lewis basically says that to his model, um, concerns regarding distributive income and poverty is not relevant. 
However, by dismissing these issues, the welfare concern doesn't suddenly magically disappear. They're still there, and poor countries still care about wanting to develop in a way that's fairer, and, you know, sometimes that uh, provides a sort of uh, income uh, equality growth. The second one is he doesn't mention the inter-sectorial shifts and the costs associated with that. He talks about labour moving from the subsistence sector to the industry sector as if it was easy. You need skills to work in the industrial sector to use capital. You need a different skill set to that than, the, uh, than that that was required in the agricultural sector. It's not so easy to transfer. He seems to have dismissed or not taken into account that there are these costs and this will limit because, you know, the capitalists will have to provide training. So maybe it'll be a little bit slow while everyone trains up for, you know, this growth to take place. And also we can think of this like in China, you know, the capitalist sector is looking to only employ young people. This is because, you know, they, they have the right skills but if the Lewis model was completely correct and there, there was no problem with shifting it then even the older people should be able to work in um, the industrial sector easily in China but this is not the case. The third one really quickly is he assumes perfect knowledge so he assumes that these people in the subsistence um, uh, market they're all economists they all understand you know they all have perfect knowledge of labor no they don't and as you will read in many development books education is the issue you know, not many people are literate. So how how do they know that this is that if they move, not only will they have personal gain, but they'll have long term economic gain for the country as well. They don't see that. And a lot of the time you find in these developing countries that it's the older generation that don't want to move. They say to their kids, No, stay in farming with me. It's tradition. It's because they don't have that perfect knowledge that maybe the kids will have more. And the fourth one is that we've seen deindustrialization take place all over the world, from Western um, economies to even um, Africa and Latin America, where we're seeing that workers are moving from the industrial sector back to the agricultural sector. Maybe perhaps because they can't compete with China, so, you know, the profits or whatever they're producing in the modern sector is not being used and thus they're having to move back to the subsistence sector as that was um, giving a higher wage than before. But again, Lewis was talking in reference to Asia and in Asia when we looked at China, the Lewis model seems to fit well when we're talking about certain things. He wasn't talking about Africa, which also has other problems like, um, you know, the quality of labor, like uh, you don't have um, that much male labor as you do in China and things like that. And, um, you know, Latin America, they're known for resource growth, so growing minerals, um, food, things like that. And also tying to Ricardo's comparative advantage, every country has an advantage. Not every country can be so amazing in doing what the modern sector provides. Some are going to be specialists in agriculture and they should pursue that. And perhaps what Lewis was saying is that countries which are developed should export their foreign uh, capital into the subsistence sector to develop that of these um, economies which are specialized in that. Sorry, as I said, this is a really long video. Um, uh, I hope you liked it and visit my blog, please.